All right, welcome. Good evening. Uh, we're on a tenth week, Ecclesiastes. I'll start off and, and uh, just see if anybody do their homework and, and write their uh, obituary last week. I didn't have to I was getting mine, so. Okay. <laughs> it's a, it's a. Explain why. It will. Yeah. Yeah. Our, our lesson last week, we, we talked about it's more valuable to be in the house of mourning than in the house of, of, of uh, feasting. And it was talking about being focused on the on, on the shortness of life, and uh, so I I encourage everybody to take some time and uh, write the obituary. So because it does it does what the lesson was about it focus you you on the shortness of life. Okay. Well, I, I still, oh, did you write yours? Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Do we get to hear it? Well, it's not, not very good. eloquent. Uh, <laughs> what did Liv say? Did you read? He's had his written for me for years, so. Yours are his. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he hasn't written mine. I don't know. Well, maybe he hasn't. Why wrote mine? <laughs> all right. All right. Mine was so, great. She was so a hot character. <laughs> so these next two lessons here, we've turned a corner. Um, we're, we're on the back side of of the book and uh, the middle the big big point in the middle of the book is fear God and we have several lessons about how we fear God in a in a, in a world that is vain and absurd and then uh, last week we had another session on, about time and the brevity of time and this week and next week we're going to be talking about the limitations of wisdom that was, that was one of the themes I mentioned in the introduction of the book. That's one of the themes of this book. The wisdom literature of Scripture, Psalms, Proverbs, Job. They're, they're limited because of the, the shortness of, of our lives. And we're going to talk about that tonight. So tonight, what he's going to talk about is the vanity of trying to understand God's providence. So we're going to have kind of three parts to this. So... The first part of this, he's going to go over some of the vain, absurd things that are going on in the world. Remember, that's where he started his search back in chapter 2, the preacher. So we're going to look at some of the things that just absolutely don't make sense in this world. And then he's going to talk about God's providence in the middle of all that and the degree to which God's wisdom helps us understand that. We're going to find out that there's a limitation on that. And then, like he's done so many, many times, he's going to bring us back to the conclusion that in spite of our inability to understand all of how God works in the world as an act of worship, we can enjoy this life and give thanks and praise uh, for how he's provided for us, what he's uh, done for us in this life. So that's kind of the outline tonight. Uh, you'll see that in the notes. Any questions before we get going? All right. Well, let me pray, and then we'll start in uh, Ecclesiastes 7. Great Lord, we give praise to you tonight that you are sovereign. This, in your word, in this, in this book, you've told us over and over again that you are sovereign over the details of this life, even though they just don't add up to us so many times. We give praise to you tonight. You've commanded us to fear you and to bear your image with honor. And we thank you, Lord, that you've given us your word and your wisdom. We thank you, Father, for what you've revealed to us. Help us to live in obedience to that. And help us, Lord, in those moments where things just don't add up. And help us to trust you in that. All right. All right. So we're in Ecclesiastes. Um, uh, seven. And again, this this you know, we've had several themes in the book, right? Life is short, death is certain, God is sovereign over all of what's going on. And he's gonna hit on that tonight again. Providence, and we use that word providence. Uh, anybody want to try to define providence? God's providence? When somebody says God's providence, what does that mean? It has to do with promise, maybe? Promise? Um, promises? Um, 
God's promise to work for good. I'll say it that way. It's God's, uh, I, I, I put it in the notes, it's God's bringing his will to accomplish his will on the earth as he steers history and he provides for his people. And, uh, you know, so it's God's working his will out for good in, in, on, on the earth. I'll, I'll use it in that context. So some of the questions that people ask a lot is, well, why does this evil thing happen, right? Why does this injustice happen? Why does this oppression happen, right? Well, all you have to do is turn your news on for about 10 seconds, right? And it's right in your face, right? Yeah. The other thing we often ask is, why does God wait to bring justice? Right? How can this go on? Why does so-and-so seem like they got away? It's got free. Well, that's some of the things we're going to be talking about. So in God's providence, why does he allow those things to go on? Why does he allow the, the you know, the, the the, you know, the uh, unrighteous to go and punish. That's some of the questions tonight. So the upshot here is that God's, has, his wisdom is limited because it, it helps us, and, and the scripture is going to talk about this tonight. There's value in fearing God and living according to his wisdom, but it's limited. And if we want, if we want it to try to explain all the where's and why's of what's going on around us, it, he hasn't revealed that to us yet. And so his wisdom is, is limited in that sense. So limited, listen. but he can't understand it, but he knows. Yeah, yeah, it's beyond, it, uh, I use the word inscrutable, uh, and we'll, we'll see that in the second part of the, of the lesson tonight. So let's look at, at the things that don't make sense. So uh, the, the preacher, remember he's on this, journey and he's trying to seek out all these things in the world and understand them. Verse 15 I have seen everything during my lifetime of futility there's a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness and there's a wicked man who prolongs his life in his wickedness in the south they might say doesn't that beat all right? <laughs> that's what he's saying he says, I, the worst thing I've seen and all the things I've seen is a righteous man who dies in his righteousness and a wicked man who prolongs his life in his wickedness. And then he says, do not be excessively righteous and do not be overly wise. Why should you ruin yourself? Do not be excessively wicked and do not be a fool. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you grasp one thing and also not let go of the other. For the one who fears God comes forth from both of them. Wisdom strengthens a wise man more than ten rulers who are in the city. Indeed, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. Also, do not take seriously all words which are spoken, lest you hear your servant cursing you. For you also have realized that you likewise have many times cursed others. I tested all this with wisdom, and I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. What has been in remote is remote and exceedingly mysterious. Who can discover it? I directed my mind to know, to investigate, to seek wisdom and an explanation, and to know the evil of folly and the foolishness of madness. I discovered more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets whose hands are chains. One who is pleasing to God will escape from her, but the sinner will be captured by her. Behold, I've discovered this, says the preacher, adding one thing to another to find an explanation, which I am still seeking, but have not found. I have found one man among a thousand, but I have not found a woman among all these. Behold, I have found only this, that God made men upright, but they have sought out many devices. What's the tone of this? What's the tone of the, what the preacher's talking about tonight? He's been on this search. Is he joyous? Is he exhausted? Is he, does he feel like he accomplished anything? He's frustrated. 
Yeah. Right? <clears throat> I set out to see all these things. Remember, remember the preacher says he's at, he says over again, I saw this. He starts off tonight, he says, I have seen this. In another wisdom literature, he talks about how he heard these things. I have seen this in verse 15. I've seen everything. He claims to have seen everything in his lifetime of futility. He said the thing that caps it off is a righteous man who dies in his righteousness and a wicked man who prolongs his life in his wickedness. Doesn't seem fair at all. Either case. So this is absurdity, right? Vanity, absurdity. This doesn't compute. I'll say it that way. All the stuff he's talking about doesn't compute. Um, he even talks about in verse 16 and 17, he's seen people have ruined their lives by trying to be excessively righteous or try to ruin their lives by being excessively foolish. You've probably seen this in your life. People have driven themselves crazy trying to be perfect and right in every little thing. And you've also seen people who've destroyed their lives by being utterly foolish with some of their decisions. So he's saying that's vanity. That's absurdity. So a lot of you, you're nodding your head. Do you have cases that come to mind where you've seen these things? Right? So you've seen them like the preacher has. And he tells us to hang on to wisdom, though, uh, to God's wisdom. In nine, verse 19, Wisdom gives us strength to live holy. Um, wisdom strengthens a wise man more than 10 rulers who are in a city. Can you imagine trying to go through life without God's wisdom, without God's guidance about what's right and wrong, and how to deal with situations? Wisdom strengthens us to face the absurdity and the craziness of life. So he's saying, hang on, to, hang on to God's wisdom. But he also warns us, verse 20, Indeed, there's not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. So if you're going to try to go through life with, with a standard of correction of not sinning or not failing, he says, it ain't going to work. So he said, part, of, part of what he's talking about tonight in the spirit of Proverbs is balance. He's going to talk a lot more about it next next week. But this idea of balance in life, and we're not trying to drive ourselves crazy or by giving ourselves over to foolishness or by trying to be perfect in everything. Because he says all that's vanity too. Um, so he's sobering us up here, isn't he? You know, just the reality of life in an absurd, vain world, there's just limits on how well you're going to be able to live your life. You're never, you're never, you're always going to have some kind of failure messing up. You said a wrong thing, you did a wrong thing. Bless God for his grace. But the reality is in an insane, crazy, absurd world where all this, stuff's going on, you're not going to be able to walk without tripping up once in a while. But God's wisdom helps us to avoid that tripping up. Verse 21, also do not take seriously all words which are spoken, lest you hear your servant cursing you. For you also have realized that you likewise have many times cursed others. You get upset when you hear somebody say something bad about you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, he might have said anything bad. Right. What? But he said, what he's saying is, what he's saying is going to happen. Yeah. It's going to happen. My mind personally says insult. Or insult, 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 saying something bad, saying something you take badly. I think some people are sometimes. We can take something personal that wasn't meant yeah. personally. Yeah. Maybe it was a suggestion or what have you. I just had an incident with someone today. I'm making a suggestion and they took it personally. You know, like I was saying, they were wrong, but that, you know. 
But he's, we live in a vain, absurd world, and he's just telling us, as good as you try to follow God's word, as, as hard as you try to fear God and walk right with him, you're going to be trip. There's going to be little trip ups. And he said, realize that, you know, you've heard somebody say something maybe not so good about you. Well, you may have said something not so good about somebody else. Part of it, it's the limits of our, of our life. So these, these are, these, these are, again, this is very practical what he's getting into tonight. Very practical about guiding us about how to try to live right in a world that's utterly crazy. But he comes to the, down to uh, 23 now. He makes another big claim here. You know, before he taught, said, I've searched out everything, right? Verse 23, I've tested all this with wisdom, and I've said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. He's a lot more humble by this part of the book than he was the first part of the book. Remember, he said, I'm, I'm the wisest guy in all the earth, and I've sought all these things out. By this point, he's getting a little humble. He said, I've seen all these things. I've tested it out by wisdom, and I can't understand it. This is Solomon, the, the, the persona of Solomon, wisest man that ever lived. And he said, I can't make it out. I've, all this vanity, I've searched it out, I've tested it. Who can discover it, he says in verse 24. He goes on, he says, I've directed my mind to know, to investigate, to seek wisdom and an explanation, and to know the evil of folly and the foolish of ma foolishness of madness. If you remember back uh, again in chapter two, the more he, the wiser he got about what was going on, the more he encountered the madness of folly. The more you know about what goes on in the world, the more you see the wickedness and the madness of what's going on. And that's what he says again here. He's going to get a little personal now here in verse 26. And when in the introduction, we said, you know, we're not sure for, we're not 100% sure this is Solomon personally writing this. This is this portion that we're going to look at here. This is one of the sections that people says, yeah, it was Solomon. Let's look at what he says about women. And I discovered more bitter than death the woman whose heart snares and nets. That could be a country song, right? <laughs> whose heart, whose hands are chains. One who is pleasing to God will escape from her, but the sinner will be captured by her. How many women did he have? Too many. Too many. Too many. <laughs> the county's concubines, about a thousand. Oh, and he didn't find a good one. Apparently not. Apparently, Apparently not. We're going to talk about He's that. He's looking in the wrong place. That was wrong with his figure. <laughs> um, but in, in spite of all these warnings, you know, we, we've gone through the book and it's warned us about fearing God. It's told us, to, uh, you know, to fear God and to, and, to, and to enjoy what God's given us. Well, he's giving, he gives us a hint here that even in all his seeking out pleasure with all these women, it was more bitter than death, the woman whose heart is snares and nets and whose hands are chains. Where did his women lead him to? Idolatry. Idolatry, away from God. Snares and nets and hands are chains. They led him away from God. And, and you know, and you get the idea he regrets this. Behold, I've discovered this, says the preacher, adding one thing to another to find an explanation. I've tried to make it all add up, which I'm still seeking, but have not found. I've, I've only found one man around a thousand. Note the word thousand here. Maybe thinking it in terms of his women. But I've not found a woman among all of these. So people have been down on the preacher because he's not so kind to women in, in this particular scripture. But his point is he can't find male, male or female. He can't find anybody that can make sense of all of the things that are going on in the world. And the capper here uh, is verse 29. 
Behold, of all the things, the, the capstone of all this absurdity, behold, I found only this, that God made men upright, but they've sought out many devices. Back to Genesis 1. What was, what was man created to be? He was created in the image of God, to bear the image of God in honor. And sinless. But every man sins. God made men upright, but they have sought out many devices. So all this seeking out, all these things that he's chased through the book, right? He's chased accomplishments. He's chased women. He's chased wealth. He's chased power. He's chased learning. And he sought it out, and it all went down the road toward idolatry and, and taking uh, people into uh, vanity and absurdity. So the ultimate thing that doesn't make any sense is this creature being made in the image of the creator and then turning in rebellion in all these other devices that he talks about. So that's the capstone of all this vanity, of his search, of what he's sought out here. Ugly picture, isn't it? How does someone go down from God giving him all, everything, with, I mean, with gifts or wisdom, but he got everything? Like we say sometimes about people. They have everything that money can buy, but they're still not happy. You know, happy, that's not in things that do not bring happiness. But you thought he'd be smarter than that. I mean, he had all that wisdom. <laughs> what happened to him? If it, did, if it didn't prevent him from going off huh? in the wrong direction, why should we think <laughs> it prevent us, right? Yeah. And don't you think he didn't have it in his heart? It was... <laughs> maybe so. Uh, His wisdom. Maybe so. Because I don't see how he could do all, have all those women the, uh, you know, love the Lord. Seems to me he took his his enjoyment in women instead of being in the world. And 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 all these other things that he's chased, mm -hmm. right? Um, but one of the one of the messages here that you can't you can't figure out all these things. You know, how do, how does God work through all this craziness? Um, behold, I've discovered, and I'm still seeking, and have not found. I've I found one man among a thousand, and not found a woman among all these. And I see all this idolatry in verse twenty nine. Job was kind of at the same point. You know, I've, I've showed you the connections with Job as we've been going along. Job, Job asked God, look, flip over to Job 38. All right, Job, Job's big issue is uh, his friends are saying you sinned and, and you, you wronged God and that's why all these bad things came. And, um, and Job says, no, I'm, I'm, I'm innocent. And he confronts God toward the end of the book in 38, verse 12. And his, this is how God answers him. Because he's asking sort of the same question that Solomon is. How does this all make sense? That I had to go through all this suffering even though I was blameless. He's asking, it's, it's kind of the, the back side of the question that the preacher's asking. How does all this stuff make sense? How, how does your sovereignty make sense uh, in all this? And God answered Job, have you ever in your life commanded the morning? This is how God answers it. He didn't, he didn't, he, he asked Job the question and caused the dawn to know its place, that it may take hold of the ends of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it. God doesn't give him a detailed answer and say, you know, this is why, and this is why this happened to you. God just asserts his sovereignty that I built a creation and 
Job can't answer this question because he hasn't seen this, the, how the creation was made and why it works like it does. Job can't answer the question. Look, flip over a page or two in Job 40, verse 1 and 2. And the Lord said to Job, Will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Let him who reproves God answer it. Uh, God's not apologetic at all about his sovereignty here. Don't we ask the same question, God, why did this happen? Why did you allow this? Why, you know, again, why did this injustice go on? You know, why, why did that ship hit the, the bridge the other night and these people fall in the water and die? Why did you allow this? God just doesn't give us those detailed answers right now. Will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? <clears throat> Let him who reproves God answer it. In other words, God's sovereign and he's not revealing those things right now. So this is kind of where he's gotten to at the end of this. All these things that don't make sense. How in the world does God work in the world? In his providence. And, you know, you can get really upset about this, right? God's not just. He's not fair. Uh, you can get real bitter toward the church. You can get real bitter toward God. Um, you can be very angry about this. Let's see what he says next here. This, so this starts in Ecclesiastes 8, uh, verse 1. Who is like the wise man, and who knows the interpretation of a matter? A man's wisdom illumines him and causes his stern face to be. I say, keep the command of the king because of the oath before God. Do not be in a hurry to leave him. Do not join in an evil matter, for he will do whatever he pleases. Since the word of the king is authoritative, who will say to him, what are you doing? He who keeps a royal command experiences no trouble for a wise heart. No, a wise heart knows the proper time and procedure. For there is a proper time and procedure for every delight when a man's trouble is heavy upon him. If no one knows what will happen, who can tell him when it will happen? No man has authority to restrain the wind with the wind or authority over the day of death. And there's no discharge in the time of war, and evil will not deliver those who practice it. All of this I've seen and applied my mind to every deed that has been done under the sun, wherein a man has exercised authority over another man to his hurt. Verse 10. So then I have seen the wicked buried, those who used to go in and out from the holy place, and they are soon forgotten in the city where they did this. This too is utility. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly, therefore the hearts of the sons of men among them are given fully to do evil. Although a sinner does not does evil a hundred times and may lengthen his life, since I know that it will be well for those who fear God, who fear him openly. But it will not be well for the evil man, and he will not lengthen his days like a shadow because he does not fear God. There is futility which is done on the earth. That is, there are righteous men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. On the other hand, there are evil men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. This, I say this too, is futility. Now, uh, again, back the first week, I mentioned that one of the interpretations of the book is that it was used as a training manual for people who were going to be in government service during Solomon's time. And you get a little hint of that in this, in this passage because um, it's, it's talking about how do you deal with authority? How do you interact with authority? How do you, how do you handle yourself there? That's just kind of a, a sidelight here. Um, one of the other things uh, that we're gonna pick up as we go through this section Remember we talked about wisdom is knowing God's word and how to apply it in a given time and situation. So you have to know the time and the situation. 
Okay, so that comes out a little bit as we walk through this. So two things to look for here. So God's wisdom's limited in the sense that it can't explain all about his, how he works and how he's providence, but he helps us to deal with authority, even though that authority may sometimes be unjust. And that's what the first six verses are talking about. Who's like the wise man who knows the interpretation of a matter? So think about people who interpreted dreams in Scripture. Joseph, Daniel were wise in their time, and they understood the times, and they dealt a lot with authority, right? They were right before the king. So they have to watch your mouth, right? When you're before the king, you have to know a sense of what's going on. So wisdom... We have to be like Daniel and Joseph here a little bit. A man's wisdom illumines him and causes his stern face to beam. So keep the command of the king because of the oath before God. Do not be in a hurry to leave him. Know the times, know the seasons here. Do not join in an evil matter for he will do whatever he pleases. Part of God's providence is the authorities that he, the authority structure that he puts over us in this world. He's ordained civil government. Uh, I, I've given you in the notes there, Romans 13. Uh, I, I wasn't going to take time to read it tonight, but very clearly says God has ordained civil government. He's given civil government the sword in order to, to bring order on the earth. So, Part of God's providence is he works through civil government and how we interact uh, with civil government. Keep the command of the king because of the oath before God. Do not be in a hurry to leave him. In other words, join a rebellion against the king. Do not join in an evil matter for he does whatever he will. Since the word of the king is authoritative, who will say to him, what are you doing? He who keeps a royal command experiences no trouble, for our wise heart knows the proper time and procedure. Obey the king. All right? We're, we're to obey the authorities. That, you know, what the New Testament teaches, we're to obey the authorities that God's placed over us. That's part of God's providence here in his, in his wisdom for living. Verse 6, there's a proper time and a procedure for every delight when a man's trouble is heavy upon him. If you've got a grievance, there's a way to deal with it, to think through it and to deal with it wisely. <coughs> All right? You've seen people that are wise about how they deal with situations, and you've seen people that are hasty, or may say things that they regret, and get themselves into more trouble. So part of God's providence and how he works in, in, as we live in wisdom in this is, is sensing the time, the proper time and the procedure for, for situations. Um, no one tells knows what will happen. We've talked about the uncertainty. Who can tell him when it will happen? This has been one of our themes through the book. We can't predict what's going to happen. Things are changing around us. And God doesn't always warn us about what's coming. So he talks about using intuition. This is the idea in Proverbs, right, of knowing good from evil, being able to discern good from evil, being able to know the situation in order to apply God's word. This is part of how God would have us to live in his providence here. Verse 8, no man has authority to restrain the wind with the wind. You know, okay, right? I can't change the times. You know, storms blowing in tonight. I can't. I can wave my hands. I can do whatever. I can't change it. And that's we talked about in the in when we were in chapter three. There's a time for this, and there's a time for that. There's a time for this. There's a time for that. We don't get to pick those times in our life. I can't restrain the wind or have authority over the day of our death. Right? We don't get to pick that. And there's no discharge in the time of war, and evil will not deliver those who practice it. These are things that 
uh, when, you know, when the war's going on, you get your draft number comes up, you better go, right? So he's saying there's things we can't control. But in spite of all that, God is working in his providence. All this I've seen and applied my mind, but he's still saying, even in this, God's providence, you can't figure it out. As much as we want to, to know that this is going to happen, God's going to do this, and then that's going to cause this, and that's going to bring this, it's beyond, <coughs> beyond our understanding. He hasn't revealed it. He, remember how, he, how, how kind of bold he was back in chapter 2? I'm going to seek all these things out. Look at verse 9. All this I've seen and applied my mind to every deed that I've, has been done under the sun. He's thought about all, you know, he, he makes his claim, he's thought about all of what's going on in the earth. Uh, including wherein a man has exercised authority over another man to his hurt. He said, I've seen the wicked buried and, and those who used to go in and out from the holy place and they're soon forgotten. People, the, the bad guys get buried and nobody remembers all the bad stuff that they did. I've seen all this stuff. It says it's futility. I don't get it. It's vain. But God has an experience God is still working in his providence, even though I see all this stuff. Um, so there's a call to faith here. There's a call to faith. Even when we don't see justice done, right? By fearing God, you know that the day is coming that he's going to bring justice in his way and his time. There's a call to faith here. And Solomon says to the preacher, oh, be careful, the preacher, says, I, it's beyond human, con uh, human understanding to understand why God does what he does and why he doesn't do what he doesn't do. I wanted to take you to uh, uh, Matthew 13. So hold your finger in Ecclesiastes there and look over to Matthew 13. And Jesus had this to say about this subject. Part of God's providence, even as he deals with the wicked, he has to worry about the impact on the righteous. So um, I've been accused justly as it was, of spraying herbicide on wrongly on flowers in our uh, yard. <laughs> Blue bonnets to be Blue bonnets. Oh, no. no. <laughs> well, I'm glad you so I, I was after the weeds, but I got the blue bonnets too. Okay? So think about this. This is Jesus speaking in, in Matthew 13. He presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprang up and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. And the slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, why did you not sow good seed in your field? And how then does it have tares? God created this great world, and yet there's all this vanity and absurdity and idolatry going on in it. And he said to them, an enemy has done this. And the slave said to them, do you not want us then to go and gather them up? I'll take those weeds out. And he said, no, lest you, while you are gathering up the tares, you may root up the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first, gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. So part of God's providence here, and why the preacher is so frustrated, he sees all this craziness going on, but God in his mercy does his justice in his way and his time for the sake of his people. That would be the story of Joseph. That's the most amazing. Mm -hmm. We would have yanked him out of that pit and 
and, and protected him. But God had bigger plans. Off with the slave traders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we, we couldn't understand that. So he goes from the pit. He goes from the pit. He does good as a steward in the house. The next thing he's in the dungeon. Right? And God takes him through all that for his purposes. Now, did he bother to explain any of that to Joseph while he was doing it? Did he explain anything to Job while he was doing what he did with Job? That's kind of where, where the preacher's gotten to here. He doesn't have to explain it to us either. That's, that's what I'm showing you in those passages in Job. Job's pounding on the, on the table saying, why did this happen? And, and God says, well, where were you when I did this? And where were you when I did that? And that's, that's, the, call, that's the call to faith, is to trust God in the middle of all this. And that's why I call it God's inscrutable providence, because he's working. All through the book, he's sovereign, he's working, he's in control of the creation. He's going to bring justice. There's, he's going to deal with things even after our death. And he calls on us to trust him, even though we can't understand it. And, it's, and, and you know, and, and it's beyond, you know, when our kids ask, or our grandkids ask, well, why did this happen? Or why did that take place? Or why did this happen to me? And there's no explanation for it. Why did the righteous man die in his righteousness? And at the same time, the wicked man lived to be a hundred. Why? Because the sentence against an evil deed, this verse 11, is not executed quickly. He says, you know, because justice doesn't happen instantly. Right? When we, <clears throat> this is God's grace for us too, right? When we mess up, we don't get whacked upside the head immediately. In His mercy, He deals with us. But He may not, you know, it's the old lightning bolt thing, right? Every time we said something wrong, you get zapped with a lightning bolt. It doesn't happen because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly. Therefore, the hearts of the sons of men among them are fully given to do evil. Although a sinner does evil a hundred times and may lengthen his life, still I know, this is his, his statement of faith, still I know that it would be well for those who fear God, who fear him openly. Even though we can't see how God's going to bring justice, there's a call to faith here to trust him and to fear him. And in verse 13, here's another part of the statement. It, but it will not be well for the evil man and he will not lengthen his days like a shadow because he does not fear God. There will be ultimate judgment. But there's futility, verse 14, there's futility which is done on the earth that there is, uh, there are righteous men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. And on the other hand, there are evil men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. And he says that is futility. And you can just hear him want to say, why? But he he's, he's said, you got to trust God to bring his justice about in his time and his way. That's why I want you to think about the parable of the tares, the wheat and the tares. There's a promise. That's what Jesus said. There's a promise. There will be justice. But he's going to be the one that has them bundled up and, and the tares burnt in his time and place uh, when, he, when he gathers his wheat at the same time. That's all in God's sovereignty. So I'm not answering very many questions for you tonight. But I'm, I'm just reemphasizing here this. He says it's vain to drive yourself crazy trying to figure this out. That's the point of the lesson tonight. So where does he take us back to? He's done many times in the book so far. Enjoy life. Enjoy life. All right. Where's Paul tonight? He got back. I know he's back from his cruise. 
because he's the one that's always wanting to party. So, um, so this is we'll do this in honor of Paul here. So I commended pleasure, for there is nothing good for a man under the sun except to eat and to drink and to be merry, and this will stand by him in his toils throughout the days of his life, which God has given him under the sun. <laughs> When I gave my heart to know wisdom and to see the task which has been done on the earth, even though no one, uh, even though one should never sleep day or night, and I saw every work of God, I concluded that man cannot discover the work which has been done under the sun. Even though man should seek laboriously, he will not discover, though the wise men should say, I know he cannot discover. Isn't that the statement of humility? Think about where he started the book. I'm going to go off. I'm going to search all these things out. I'm going to understand wisdom. And he says, I can't understand God's providence. I can't understand how God does all this stuff, but I'm going to trust him by worshipfully living today. We've talked about this. He may, he, he, you know, the book's repetitive. My wife says, why do we keep talking about this? I said, well, because the book keeps talking about it. <laughs> but God reminds us, right? Repetition. How does God teach us? He teaches us repetition. Repetition. We've talked about this before. Over and over and over again. So this book's pounding in our head. Trust God. We can't understand all this craziness going on around us. We can trust God that he's going to bring his judgment. He's going to make things right in his time and his place. And we will worship him not by um, driving ourselves crazy. We're going to worship God by being content in what he's provided us today and enjoying what he's provided us. It's repetitive, right? We've been over this. Some of you guys haven't been here for all 10 lessons, but you, you've heard this almost every week, right? Yeah. Almost every week, he keeps telling us this, enjoy life today as an act of worship, as an act of faith. Well, that gets us to the end of lesson 10 here. Um, I want you to ask these questions. Uh, you don't have to say anything out loud, but these are your, kind of your thought questions for this week. So we talked about injustice. And, and the preacher says, I've looked all over and I've seen all these injustices that men have done to other men. So have you done any injustices that you need to make right? Now tonight, if you've not trusted Christ, you know, we, we saw in the scripture here, every, every person's going to sin. We, we read that in the first part of the lesson. If you've not trusted Christ tonight, let this be to the day of your salvation. Repent and trust Christ tonight. Make that, make that certain. Even as a Christian, we sin. If, there, if there's anybody you need to be right, made right with, what did Jesus say, right, in, in the uh, Sermon on the Mount? Before you come worship, if, you, if somebody's got something against you, you go make that right. So Solomon saw all these injustices. If you've got some, somebody's got something against you, you need to go make that right. So think about that this week. Is there anything that you need to go make right, you know, a wrong word or misunderstanding or something perhaps even? Um, have there been times where you've doubted God's care and justice? <clears throat> I think everybody ought to be able to shake yeah. their head yes yeah. on that one, right? Why did you let this happen to me? God, where are you? That's something to pray about this week in light of this lesson. Um, one, to repent of that, that's unbelief, but two, to thank God for his faithfulness. To thank God for his promise that he's going to bring justice. To thank God that he is sovereign. What, what, how would you feel walking out of here if, you, if the scripture said, no, God's not really sovereign. He's not really in control. His providence really isn't working. We all, all just go jump off the top of the building, right? Yeah. Pretty <laughs> helpless. This, 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 
you know, but think about those situations where you've been in, where you've wondered, okay, God, where is your justice? Where is your provision? And thank him, take time and thank him for those times that he was faithful, that he was good. There may be times where you've seen him, uh, you know, God, God knows who our enemies are and he deals with them. Maybe there's been times where you've seen him deal with your enemies. Thank him for his justice and his providence. Um, the, you know, the last note I put in, the injustice in this world causes us to trust in God's providences and future judgment. That's kind of the upshot of the lesson. Go home and watch the news for 10 seconds tonight. Um, in the light of that, instead of despairing, that's what kind of what the upshot of the lesson is, instead of despairing of this vanity in the world as an act of faith, thank God tonight that he is sovereign, that he is just, that he is going to bring righteousness, and his will is going to be done on the earth as it is in heaven. So it's a call to faith and thanksgiving. What I would suggest tonight. Remember, he said, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. He, uh, for us to take it, but he'll, he'll make it right. He'll make it right in his time. We may not get to see it in this life. There may be a lot of things that we'd like to see dealt with, but we may never get to see them in this life. Anything else tonight? Oh, I hope. You know, this can be a real downer, okay? No, no doubt about it. Well, I hope you guys. Take this as a call to faith. As a call to faith and trust in God for his providence and his justice. Anything else tonight? Well, welcome you guys for joining us tonight. All right, well, next week, we're going to keep chugging on. We're going to be in Ecclesiastes 9. And I called this on the rats winning uh, and dealing with the rat race. And the theme next week is about balance. That living wisely in an absurd world causes, calls for a balanced life. And he's going to talk about where people get too far off here or too far off here. It's a call for balance. So that's what next week's about. All right, we'll close. Great Lord, we praise you. We thank you that you are sovereign, utterly sovereign. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are utterly sovereign over all things. You are the king of the universe. And we bow our knee to you tonight, Lord, thanking you for your providence, for the ways that you are at work in this world, even though we can't understand them. And we praise you for that day when you will bring utter justice in all things. We praise you tonight in Christ's name. Amen. Yeah,